message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for another interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join them now. Glad that you've joined us again today, and we certainly hope that our Bible study will be a blessing to you. Uh, it's our purpose and, and intent to have every one of our studies every week to be something that blesses and encourages you and helps you to understand and enjoy the Bible. If you can come to understand and enjoy the Bible, then the Word of God can go to work in your life and be something that's profitable to you. We've been surveying in our, in our last few studies one of the great chapters in the Word of God, Acts chapter number 2. This chapter is, if not the most difficult, certainly one of the most difficult chapters in all of the Bible. Uh, it's, it's stained with the blood of many a battled, weary warrior in spiritual matters. And no one, nobody, us, you, anyone else, should enter it flippantly or without due regard to the dangers that, that lurk in this chapter. Uh, Acts chapter 2 is one of the great bloody battlefields of, of, of Scripture. And it's, my friend, it's been the Waterloo of many a, a would-be soldier for Christ. So we want to be very careful as we come into this chapter to, to as we cross its terrain, we want to be very careful to, to stay very closely to exactly what the Bible actually says and not to be making jumps uh, off into other things. We want, to, we want to notice what the Bible actually says, not what it's presumed to say or presumed to teach, but what it actually does say and what it does teach. And I want to remind you that, that in, in the past probably five weeks we've been discussing some of these issues and we've, we've seen so far conclusively without any, without any, any uh, uh, wavering or, or, or misunderstanding, we've discovered that Acts chapter 2 is not, and I emphasize it is not the beginning of the body of Christ. It is absolutely impossible if words mean anything. It is absolutely impossible for the church, the body of Christ, of which believers are a part today, it is absolutely impossible for the church, the body of Christ, to have begun on the day of Pentecost if words in the Bible mean anything. Now you notice I didn't say if denominational doctrine means anything. I didn't say that if religious tradition means anything, and I didn't say if a body of scholarship and tradition means anything, I said if the words on the page in a Bible mean anything, then it's clear that the body of Christ, the church of this present dispensation, did not begin on the day of Pentecost. And we've studied that and seen that, and, and, and I've, I'm not going to go back and repeat five weeks worth of Bible studies here with you. I just say to you that we've discovered that conclusively without any question. If you don't understand that issue, maybe you're just tuning in and you say, horror of horrors, here's somebody that's saying something different from what I've always heard. And the problem you see when you don't start the body of Christ on the day of Pentecost, uh, immediately the, the so-called Great Commission, the post-resurrection instructions of Christ to His apostles, immediately those, 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 that commission uh, also is, is omitted. Also, you have to understand that that commission was given to someone other than members of the body of Christ. Immediately, you have to understand that the ordinance and the practice of water baptism, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, was given to someone other than the body of Christ. Immediately, you have to understand that the tongues program and the miraculous demonstration program on the day of Pentecost was given to someone other than members of the body of Christ. And I understand. There's much tradition, much denominational doctrine, much, much uh, religious uh, uh, heritage involved in making Pentecost their, uh, the roots and the birthday of the church. And the cry is, is often heard, we, got, we need to go back to Pentecost, back to Pentecost. But I'm saying to you, and we're, we're discovering from the Scripture, that we don't need to go back to Pentecost. What we need to do is go on to Paul. Because perfection for the believer today, don't go back to Pentecost, go on to perfection. And perfection, spiritual maturity, is not found at Pentecost. Spiritual maturity is going to be found in the epistles of Paul. And you'll either go on, on, on to Paul and his epistles, or you're going to go back to confusion and disappointment and spiritual destruction. 
Now, when you come to Acts 2, you need to, un you need to understand that's the vantage point that you have to cross the terrain from. Acts chapter 2, clearly, if the words on the page in the King James Bible mean anything, it's not the church, the body of Christ. It's not the beginning of the body of Christ. It's not the body of Christ at all. It has to do with God's program for the nation Israel. Now, the reason there are two real problems in Acts 2 that, 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 uh, that come up when, when people try to go back to Acts 2 as their, their marching orders and as their practice, one of the problems is Acts 2.38. And we're going to look at that in some detail in the broadcast today. The other problem is what follows Acts 2.38. That is the program, the miraculous signs and wonders, the selling all that you have and the, having all things in common and the, and the temple worship and those things. We'll study that uh, in, in, in a later date. No one... And I just say it to you, I, I, you know, I, I understand that I'm intense, I get excited, I get intense, the Word of God's important to me and the things that it teaches, I don't care where I'm teaching, what's, what the verses I'm reading at the moment teach is, is very important to me. And I understand that sometimes I get, char you know, I sort of get to charging down the track like a locomotive, but I want to be very careful that you understand what I'm saying to you. No one, not me, not you, not any preacher you have ever heard claim anything to the contrary. No one practices Acts 2.38 or any of the program of, on the day of Pentecost today. There may be someone listening to me now that you say, oh, but I do. But I want to tell you, oh, but you don't. You may try to. You may seek to. You may claim to. But you see, God Himself has rendered it impossible to practice in reality the things that are here because the things that are contained in Acts chapter 2 are supernatural things that God Himself must do for you. And God is not doing these things today. And the reason they don't work in your life, and if you'd be honest and you'd look right into, the, into your heart of hearts and be honest with yourself, Quit trying to, to defend your integrity or the integrity of your church or try to stand up for God's honor in, in some misguided attempt to, to vindicate Him. If you just admit in your heart of hearts, you know that the reality that these verses demonstrate isn't really in existence in your life, and there's an answer for it. You see, rather than the Word of God being a burden and a heartache to you and a, and, and a source of confusion, it can be a blessing. It can be a source of blessing and light. And what we, we're trying to do is to show you how to understand the Word of God so you can enjoy the Word of God so that that Word can work effectually in you that believe. The only way to do that is to recognize that the things that were taking place on the day of Pentecost have nothing to do with the program today. Acts 2.38 is a, is a classic example. Peter says unto them, repent, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now what in the world, you know, you just stare that verse right square in the face when you read down through Acts 2. Most fundamentalists just ignore it. Some of them come along and, and, and dodge it by trying to change it. But there's always some kind of a song and dance done to get around it by people that understand that salvation today is by grace through faith alone, by grace, through faith, plus nothing. If you understand salvation as it's presented in Paul's epistles, you understand that salvation today, the forgiveness of your sins, the possession of eternal life, uh, the reception of eternal life to be had as a present possession is, is by simply trusting in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary. Paul says, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. He says, to him that works not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith, faith, faith is counted for righteousness. Not faith in works, not faith that works, but faith that refuses to work. A man believes what God says today, and instead of his faith expressing itself in works, as in Acts 2.38, it expresses itself by refusing to work. Now, someone who understands that, then they read Acts 2.38, and in Acts 2.38 you repent and be baptized. Why? for the remission of sins, so that you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you want your sins forgiven and you want to receive the gift of eternal life from God Almighty, you have to repent, change your mind, and be baptized. That's water baptized. That is, that is your faith has to express itself in works, certain kind of works. And we'll talk about what they are and why they are in a minute. 
But when you understand the difference between the way Paul preaches salvation by grace through faith plus nothing and the way Peter on Pentecost preaches salvation by uh, the, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, you say, well, well, this is the way, this is, this, well, I don't know what to do with that, so I'll just ignore it. Or somebody comes along and they use what's called the ice bag, you know. Uh, that is the preposition for the remission of sins. For is the Greek preposition ice. And people say, well, you know, that, that really means for. It means because of or unto the forgiveness of sins. Because you've already received the forgiveness of sins. Well, you stay tuned because I'll show you in a minute from the Word of God how the Bible interprets itself and demonstrates that the ice bag is just all wet. Uh, fundamentalists kind of ignore it. They dodge it or they'll change it and try to redo it. Uh, some of the brethren, uh, some, some denominations, some, some churches, uh, they take Acts 2.38. And uh, they, they say it's exactly what, what we ought to be doing. We ought to repent. We ought to be baptized. And you can't have your sins permitted if you aren't baptized. And that's the plan of salvation for today. And they, they ignore the further revelation given by the Lord Jesus Christ through the Apostle Paul, a revelation that was acknowledged and vouchsafed by the Apostle Peter, in Acts chapter 15. You see, if Peter stood on this program today, if the man who spoke in Acts 2 stood on this television station today and spoke to you, he would tell you, don't follow the program in Acts 2, follow the program God gave through the Apostle Paul, for it has superseded this program. It has replaced, God has made a further revelation. But people that don't recognize the further revelation given by Christ through Paul go back to Acts 2.38, go back to a past program and say, that's it. You see, Acts 2 is a battleground only if you fail to rightly divide the word of truth. The only time you'll have a, have a problem with it is when you don't recognize the mystery reveal through the Apostle Paul. When you don't recognize that other Apostle Paul with that other message, the message of grace, in that other program, the dispensation of grace. If you don't recognize that, Acts chapter 2 is going to be a problem for you. If you do recognize it, you can see immediately where it fits. For example, let's read the passage and let's, let's just study it for what it says, okay? And see how it fits in the program of God where it fits dispensationally. Acts 2 verse 34, it's 37. Now when they, and that's Israel, Peter's been preaching to the nation Israel. You'll remember the, the, you'll remember the history. Jesus Christ had come, John the Baptist had, had, had come and, and, and told, uh, introduced the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Christ, our, Christ showed up and, and came and preached to his nation. They rejected him. They crucified him. They said, away with him. We'll have no king but Caesar. And he dies. God the Father raises him from the dead. He spends 40 days with his apostles. Then he ascends back into heaven. Then the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. Now that's where we are. The Holy Spirit has come on the day of Pentecost here after all this ministry back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And now we're over here in, in, in the Acts period, in, in Acts chapter 2 here. The Holy Spirit has come on the day of Pentecost now. And Peter has stood up and explained, uh, he's speaking as the Spirit gave, gives him utterance, he's, he's explaining to Israel that Jesus was validated, approved of God among them with signs and wonders. They mistook him, they crucified him. He's gone away. God is going to send him back. God raised him up, took him at his right hand. He's sitting at the Father's right hand, verse 24 and 25, say, expecting till henceforth he would make his enemies his footstool. In other words, he's gone away, sent the Holy Spirit back down to testify that he's the Messiah. And one day he's going to come back over here and pour out his wrath on his enemies and then set up his kingdom over here. And Peter is warning Israel about fleeing from this wrath to come over here. And they say to him, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They got into conviction about what they had done. They were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Well, that isn't what it says. That's what Paul later told the Philippian jailer. Back here, they don't say, believe on the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They say, repent, change your mind, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Change your mind about, about Jesus. You, you, you said away with him. He's a mocker. He's a deceiver. Change your mind about who you see he is instead of reject, accept your Messiah, and 
and confess Him as your Messiah in the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You see, water baptism for the nation Israel was a very important issue. Now the plan is very clear. Peter, Peter's instructions are very clear. He's following exactly what Christ taught him to, 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 to tell people in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. I want you to go back with me to two passages. When he says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, this is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ had taught him to, to say. Get Mark chapter 16 in one hand and Mark chapter number 1. Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 16. Now let, look, at, look at the verses in your Bible and look at what they say. When Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He was interpreting the commission that Christ had given him during his, his post-resurrection time with him. Jesus says to his disciples in Mark 16, verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, and that will be the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus Christ had given these people, his apostles back here, a gospel, the gospel of the kingdom to preach. That's what they'd been preaching for all this period of time back here. And he says, go into all the world and preach that gospel of the kingdom to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now that's real clear. If you want to get saved, what do you do? You repent you believe, you change your mind, he that believeth and is baptized. You see, the nation Israel, if you let, let's use a different color here, if you let this blue line here represent the nation Israel, the nation Israel was an apostasy. The nation Israel was in, 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 the, in, the, in the, 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 the clutches of, of idolatry. And what, what the Messiah is going to do when He comes back over here is He's going to save them from their sin, from their idolatry. He's going to move the idol away from them. And they're told back in, in the new covenant that God's going to make with them that I will sprinkle you with clean water and will cleanse you from the, all the filthiness of your idols. Will I, will I cleanse you? And in Israel back here, starting back here with John the Baptist... The ministry of John the Baptist, the ministry of Christ, and the ministry of the apostles in early Acts, they're going in here and they're preaching. Mark chapter 1, verse number 4. John, John the Baptist, did preach in the wilderness the, and did, did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He told Israel, he said, you better repent. The Messiah is coming and the way you repent is, is, is you, the way you give outward expression of the inward heart repentance is through the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That is, these people were identified together with the Messiah with the, as the believing remnant in Israel. What John the Baptist preached, what Christ trained and, and, and commissioned Peter to preach, he preaches on the day of Pentecost. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sins had to do with them identifying themselves together as the believing remnant, those people in Israel who believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that He was going to come back over here, that He was going to restore the nation, and that He was going to make them a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Folks, the nation Israel was created for the purpose, and we've studied this, of being a kingdom of priests. And when you ordain a priest into the ministry, Luke, Exodus chapter 29, Leviticus 8 and so forth, very clear that when you ordain a priest into the ministry, you do three things. Number one, you wash him with water. There's the water baptism. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You, you give a ceremonial cleansing to cleanse him from the, and separate him unto his office. And then you offer a sacrifice. You sprinkle them with the blood of the sacrifice. And then you anoint them with oil. John the Baptist comes, preaches the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Separating away, cleansing them away. The ceremonial cleansing, the outward expression of their faith, separating themselves unto God. Jesus Christ offers the sacrifice and then the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is poured out on them, the anointing. The nation is being prepared to function as a kingdom of priests in the kingdom that Jesus Christ was raised to sit upon the throne of David over there. The whole program in Acts 2 is that kingdom program over there. And the whole issue 
in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, is preparing this nation to be delivered from the wrath of God in the tribulation into the kingdom and be the kingdom of priests that God ordained them to be. And that's exactly why he says to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, number one, for the remission of sins. Have your, the filthiness of your idolatry cleansed, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those two things. That's the two things that had to happen to get the priest ordained into his office. Now come with me, if you will, to Acts chapter number 3, and notice this issue of gaining the remission of sins. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. As I said, some of the brethren use what they call the ice bag. They say, well, for there meant not so they could get it over there, but because they do have it already. But that isn't what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 3, verse number 18, the day after Pentecost, Peter is preaching. But those things which God, Acts 3.18, those things which God has before showed by the mouth of all His prophets that Christ should have suffered, He has so fulfilled. He's fulfilled everything prophecy said had to come to pass here. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Why? That your sins may be blotted out. What? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Repent and, uh, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Watch. When? When are their sins going to be blotted out? When, the verse says, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all His prophets since the world began. Jesus Christ goes away on exile. He'll come again back over here. And when he comes back, that's when they get their sins remitted, according to Acts 3.19. You see, folks, their sins, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. If you ask Peter, Peter, when were their sins going to be remitted? He would say, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. They were to be baptized back here looking unto a future blotting out, a future atonement when Jesus Christ came back at the great day of atonement. Now we've studied this. There's the, great, there's, there's the Passover, Leviticus 23. The next great feast is the Feast of Pentecost right there. Then there's a gap. In, the, in, in, in there of a, uh, of a couple of months. Then there's the Feast of Trumpets, the regathering of Israel. Then there's the Day of Atonement, the Second Advent. Then there's the Feast of Tabernacles, a type of the kingdom. When does Israel have their sins blotted out? Right over there. When does Acts 2.38 say they're going to get their sins blotted out? Right over there. You see, folks, that's exactly the pattern of Old Testament prophecy. Old Testament prophecy is very clear. That, that, that God Almighty was going to take away their sins according to the new covenant when Jesus Christ came back at that great day. Of, that's when there's a fountain for cleansing open under the house of David for sins and cleansing right over there. We sing that old hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And that, that song is a, is a, is, it, a spinoff of Zechariah 13.1. But if you read Zechariah 13.1, that fountain that's open for cleansing in, 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 uh, uh, in, in Jerusalem for the house of David isn't filled with blood, it's filled with water. And it takes place when Christ comes back over there. When they look upon Him whom they've pierced and they mourn, they repent for what they've done to Him. What am I talking about? Folks, we're just saying that over there in that future day, Acts 2.38, if you follow that program, that order, what you have is you have, you repent and you're baptized for remission of sins that come to you out there in the future. To follow Acts 2.38 today, you have absolutely no assurance of a present possession of sins forgiven. Now I want you to notice the contrast between that program and what God's doing today in the dispensation of grace, in the secret program in here that has interrupted prophecy. In the, in the now time revelation given through Paul, there is an entirely different order of events. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5, verse number 11. 
If you follow Acts 2.38 today, it just means that you're not going to know that your sins are forgiven until, until, until Christ comes back or until you get to heaven. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, we trust he'll, he'll forgive us our sins in heaven at last? That comes from going back here. You don't know whether your sins are forgiven until you get there. But that's not the program for today. Romans chapter 5, verse 11. Paul says, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. What Israel is having to wait out there to get, we have right now simply by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, if you'll lay aside right this minute your, tradi your religious traditions, and you'll rejoice in the sunlight of God's grace to you in Christ, you'll know this moment the joy of sins forgiven completely and totally through the finished work of Jesus Christ. You have it as a present possession. Your sins forgiven, eternal life given as a gift, both of which you possess right now. That's why it's important not to go back over here and to the wrong program, but to follow God's Word for us today. We don't need to go back to Pentecost. We need to go on, on, on over here to the epistles of Paul and get the truth that operates today. Now just so that you don't misunderstand, so that you can study this and, and get to the, the bottom of it yourself, we've got a free tape we'd like to give you, a cassette tape on Acts 2.38. In fact, that's just the title of it. It's just called Acts 2.38. The brother Mel will come to the, to the microphone in just a minute and make, give you the address and the phone number that you can write. Listen, why don't you write today or call us today and get your free tape. It's titled Acts 238. Just ask for the tape on Acts 238. We'll know what you're talking about. We'd like to give it to you free. It's our gift to you with the prayer that it'll help you to understand and enjoy the Word of God. Thanks for listening today. We're always glad to have you. And we trust that the Bible study will be a blessing to you. Get your friends listening in with you too, will you? And join us again next week. Until then, Maranatha. Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have a cassette tape that we would like you to have to go along with today's study. The tape is entitled Acts 2.38. It is yours free of charge. It is our way of saying thanks for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy along with a free subscription to our monthly Bible study, The Grace Journal. If you simply write us here at The Message of Grace, the address should be on your screen. That's The Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you can also call us during normal business hours at area code 708-529-0520. Request tape offer number 185. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us today. If our study has been a help to you, we would be happy to put you in touch with a Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His rightly divided Word. And friend, if you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you will have eternal life as a present possession, let us know, and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is The Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace.